Welcome back to week six. This segment and the next one focus on national security and the impact of national security legislations or concerns over the realization of freedom of expression and information. For this first segment on national security, I will focus on the international standard that should govern the relationship between national security and freedom of expression. In the next segment, I will highlight how those standards are actually currently not being implemented and why for many um, activists, lawyers, uh, commentators around the world, national security has re-emerged as a major cause for the violation of freedom of expression. But let's first look at what ought to be the relationship between national security and freedom of expression. In the aftermath of 9-11, we have seen the adoption of a large number of anti-terrorism laws and policies throughout the world, many of which resulted in restrictions to freedom of, of expression. There is a report from Human Rights Watch in this week's readings, which I will encourage you to, uh, to review. It demonstrates a, the vast number of laws adopted around the world and the fact that the large majority of them violate human rights uh, by themselves, even without mentioning their implementation. In 2015, the rise of Daesh, or ISIS, responsible for terrorist attacks in Iraq, Syria, France, Turkey, Tunisia, to mention a few places, and Daesh recruitment of so-called foreign fighters has led governments to adopt additional measures, including through the promulgation of state of emergency and new anti-terrorism and surveillance laws. This context and the government's response have impacted on freedom of expression in many ways. And I'm going to highlight five of those ways. First, a number of people have been charged with various speech-related offenses on the ground of counterterrorism and national security, such as incitement to violence or glorification of terrorism. These charges have multiplied around the world, but also uh, including established democracies. Under the legitimate objective of countering terrorism, new policies have been developed to prevent or counter violent radicalization or extremism, all of which have included a strong focus on expression, opinion, and thoughts. A second uh, consequence of the current context is that the national security net has been cast very far to capture expressions that, in my opinion and in the opinion of quite a few others, have little to do with violence, let alone terrorism. As I am uh, filming this video, one of my friends and colleague from Turkey uh, and the Turkish representative for the Press Freedom Organization's Reporters Without Borders is in prison. He has been charged with terrorism-related offenses. And I can assure you, there is no more uh, peace-loving uh, person than Erol. A third uh, consequence of the environment is that online expression and the digital world more generally, have been included and largely targeted in the fight against terrorism. There are a number of good reasons for, for that process. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to, to go over it, but you uh, have possibly, probably heard many times about the way various terrorist groups are using internet to uh, to find new, uh, new fighters and to more generally find people uh, sympathetic to their cause and radicalized others. At least so does, say, the, the theory. In order to uh, include and make the digital world part of the fight against terrorism, this has required 
involving and some have said co-opting uh, social media and other intermediaries in the fight, including through the adoption of various policies requesting that intermediaries monitor content and react swiftly to state demands for content take down. Indeed, increasingly, social media platforms are taking down content without state request. As I am preparing for, for this course and, and filming this video, there has been repeated reports that some of the, web, the web's biggest destinations for watching videos in particular have quietly started using automation to remove extremist content, quotation mark for extremist, from their site quite automatically. We, we will have to see how this uh, process is going to unfold, but uh, there is certainly a trend at the moment towards um, an automatic algorithm-based removal of such a content without human intervention or limited human intervention. A fourth uh, development, um, recent development, is that national security concerns and the threat of terrorism have justified various forms of surveillance over private communication and the collection of the so-called big data, all of which have been said to create a chilling effect on freedom of expression, along with potentially violating the right to privacy. We have uh, already reviewed uh, surveillance in the, in the previous week, but um, it is a very important element of the current context related to uh, national security and freedom of expression. A fifth uh, consequence, a fifth characteristic of the current environment is that the real threats of terrorism and concerns for national security in many parts of the world have shrunk the public space and public debate. The fears to weaken the, um, the, the, the resolve of governments, the fear to strengthen the hands of those determined to engage in acts of terrors have weakened the um, opportunities and the uh, determination of politicians, of public officials, but also of the media and civil society to, um, to engage in, um, in scrutiny over counter-terrorism strategy and activities and to actively debate their, uh, their raison d'etre and the way they are being implemented. So there is, um, is self-censorship around, around those questions at the moment, at least when I am uh, filming this, this video. There is not currently informed public debates over policies, strategies or activities whose implementation has often resulted, to some degree or another, in the curtailment of civil and political rights. There are some actors that are raising concerns, raising alarm, usually the, the same actors, but the political sphere, the political actors who should be uh, driving the, the debate over national security are actually not doing so at the moment. And, um, this is a, a, a very a worrying trend in terms of public debate and public space over a crucially important element in public policies. Next, uh, I want to focus on the impact of the current wave of national security and counterterrorism on norms related to freedom of expression. And here I'm going to first highlight the international standard as far as freedom of expression and national security are concerned. There are standards that have been developed over a number of years by international, and, and, uh, by international bodies, by international experts, backed up by, by court decision. Uh, these um, developments are due to the fact that national security and counter-terrorism have been frequently invoked by governments to justify excessive curtailment of the right to freedom of expression and other rights. So what we are witnessing at the moment is not by any, 
any stretch a new phenomenon. It is something that has been repeated throughout the last 50 years and indeed before that. The difficult relationship and tension between national security and human rights protection has been the object of, as a result, much elaborations, debate and jurisprudence. As explained throughout the course, the right to freedom of expression is not absolute and may be restricted under narrow conditions highlighted in Article 19 of the International Co Covenant. This is the so-called three-part test. Uh, the restrictions must be provided by law. The grounds for restrictions must be specific. That includes um, the protection of national security and the restrictions must be uh, necessary and proportionate. So national security is one of the permissible grounds for limiting the right to freedom of expression. How is this to be implemented has been the, uh, the object of additional standard setting because you know, it's, it's um, not, uh, not uh, an easy area of law. I am going to highlight two uh, sources here on uh, the way this balance between national security and freedom of expression should be reached. In 1995, a group of experts in international law, national security and human rights, met to unpack and clarify the relationship between national security and freedom of expression. Of their discussion emerged the Joburg principles, which are based on international and regional laws and standards relating to the protection of human rights, evolving state practice, and the general uh, principle of, of law, such as the 1985 CIQ's principles on the limitation and derogation provisions in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, I will also consider the, um, the analysis made by the Human Rights Committee, which, as you know now, is the expert body responsible for overseeing the implementation of the ICCPR. So, when can uh, a claim be made that national security must be invoked in order to restrict freedom of expression? The Johannesburg Principles provide that a restriction is not legitimate unless its purpose and effect is to protect a country's existence or its territorial integrity against the use or threat of force or its capacity to respond to the use or threat of force, whether from an external source, such as a military threat, or an internal source, such as an incitement to violent overthrow of the government. The Human Rights Committee, in its General Comment uh, 34, has also elaborated on the uh, factors that may justify a claim uh, for national security. It has highlighted that if a state invokes national security to restrict freedom of expression, it must demonstrate in specific and individualized fashion the precise nature of the threat and the necessity and proportionality of the specific action taken, in particular by establishing a direct and immediate connection between the expression and the threat. The Human Rights Committee has insisted that it is not compatible to invoke anti-terrorism or national security law to suppress or withhold from the public information of legitimate public interest that does not harm national security, or that it is not legitimate to prosecute journalists, researchers, environmental activists, human rights defenders, or others for having disseminated such information. So here, the, the standard, at least in theory, is fairly clear. So what kind of expression B can be restricted under the standard set forth by those expert body? The key test for restrictions on freedom of expression in the name 
of national security is set out in principle six of the Jobert principles, which prohibits restrictions on expression unless one, the expression is intended to incite imminent violence. Two, it is likely to incite such violence. And three, there is a direct and immediate connection between the expression and the likelihood of occurrence of such violence. These three conditions are very much in keeping with the uh, jurisprudence on incitement to violence that you can find in many parts of the world and particularly in the United States, but not only. The Johannesburg Principles also state that governments should not invoke national security to protect a government from embarrassment or exposure of wrongdoing or to conceal information about the functioning of its public institutions or to entrench a particular ideology or to suppress industrial arrest. Similarly, the Human Rights Committee has warned against the risk of abusing national security and it has stressed that it is incompatible with international standard to restrict the freedom of journalists and others to travel outside, to restrict the entry of foreign journalists or to restrict freedom of movement of journalists and human rights investigators within the state party. The Human Rights Committee has also demanded that state parties should recognize and respect that element of the right of freedom of expression that embraces the journalist uh, privilege of not to disclose information sources. And I have already mentioned a number of cases here of the protection of sources in the context of uh, countering terrorism. The Human Rights Committee considered the extent to which terrorism and counterterrorism may constitute legitimate ground for restricting freedom of expression. It concluded that, and I quote, such offenses as encouragement of terrorism and extremist activities, as well as offenses of praising, glorifying or justifying terrorism should be clearly defined to ensure that they do not lead to unnecessary or disproportionate interference with freedom of expression. Excessive restrictions on access to information must also be avoided. I continue to quote here from the Human Rights Committee. The media plays a crucial role in informing the public about acts of terrorism and its capacity to operate should not be unduly restricted. In this regard, journalists should not be penalized for carrying out their legitimate activities end of quote. So that I think is a very strong and fairly clear position of the Human Rights Committee on, um, on the relationship between national security and freedom of expression. I do not want you to think that those principles are just theoretical with no grounding in the reality. In fact, this is not the case. They are based on courts, decisions around the world including by regional and international tribunals. Um, they are not idealist, uh, they are not naive, they have been reached by many judges around the world. Unfortunately, currently, uh, those uh, decisions are a minority. Um, I will end this segment by highlighting one decision from the United States because it resonates uh, across the world and across time. This was an, an earlier decision regarding um, New York Times versus United States, and it's a decision that is better known as the Pentagon Papers case. President Richard Nixon had claimed executive authority to force the New York Times to suspend publication of classified information in its possession. The question before the court was whether the constitutional freedom of the press guaranteed by the First Amendment was subordinate to a claimed need of the executive branch of government to maintain the secrecy of information, and in this case it was all about national security. 
the US Supreme Court ruled that the First Amendment did protect the right of the New York Times to print the materials. And um, I'm going to read from that decision. Justice Hugo Black wrote an opinion that has elaborated on the importance of protecting freedom of expression, including in the context of a national security issue. And he said, only a free and unstrained press can effectively expose deception in government. And paramount among the responsibility of a free press is a duty to prevent any part of the government from deceiving the people and sending them off to distant lands to die of foreign fevers and foreign shot and shell. We are asked to hold that the executive branch, the Congress and the judiciary can make laws abridging freedom of the press in the name of national security. To find that the president has inherent power to halt the publication of news would destroy the fundamental liberty and security of the very people the government hopes to make secure. The word security is a broad, vague generality whose contours should not be invoked to abrogate the fundamental law embodied in the First Amendment. The guarding of military and diplomatic secrets at the expense of informed representative government provides no real security. In this first segment on national security, I have highlighted the international standards that have governed and should govern the relationship between freedom of expression and national security. No one denies the legitimacy of national security concerns to restrict freedom of expression. But historical evidence and current evidence demonstrate that these are also the most abused of all grounds for restrictions. As the next segment will demonstrate, this is an historical lesson that has not been learned. National security, including countering terrorism claims, are currently restricting freedom of expression in ways which largely go over the permissible limits. Thank you very much.